Okay, everybody, you're very welcome along to this week's um, Executive Office Committee mem uh, members. Just to update everybody that we are now uh, broadcasting live on the Assembly's channels. Uh, Clerk, have we received any apologies for today's meeting? No, no, just George Robinson to be late. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, under Chairman's remarks, just a couple of very quick items today. Um, I'd probably dash people's hopes in case they were expecting uh, week two that this isn't the Hansford Parish Council. Uh, Martina isn't Jackie Weaver. Uh, but after last week's um, uh, technical difficulties that we had during our meeting, I think we recovered well from them. Uh, but we've certainly learned a lesson or two from that. But uh, in case anybody saw that and thought we're, we're going to be tip top today and have all the technical things correct for this week's meeting. Uh, but I'd like to thank members for their patience last week. It really was a case of anything that could go wrong did go wrong, uh, and I'm sure it provided a bit of entertainment, but we got there in the end with it. Um, also, I want to take an opportunity to congratulate Mark Brown, uh, who is one of the Executive Office uh, Department Directors, who was successfully appointed to the position of Permanent Secretary at the Department of Education. Uh, so we'll wish him well. I know that he's been involved for the last number of years and a lot of the the main work streams through the, the executive office department. And uh, I know that he had done a considerable amount of work and worked hard with groups on the ground, but we'll wish him well over in the Department of Education. And maybe, Clark, we could write a letter from the committee just to him and, and wish him well uh, as he undertakes that new role. Uh, also, members, the Finance Committee uh, has agreed to commission experts to advise on particular financial matters arising from the protocol. Now, in view of its, its oversight role, the Committee for the Executive Office has been asked to co-commission this selection of experts with the Finance Committee, uh, and it's envisaged that the advice sought will be cost-free. So would there be agreement amongst members to co-commission with the Finance Committee a selection of experts to look into that? Yep. Yep. Martina? Um, Chair, yep. I'm on mute. Yep, go ahead. Um, Chair, just so long that we're across the um, the panel, the selection of the panel, so that it's both the committees um, are involved in the selection of the panel as opposed to just one committee. Yeah, absolutely. I think it would only be fair that we're going to co-commission that we're, we get oversight of that. Okay, thank you, members. Um, members, draft minutes um, from last week's uh, meeting uh, from the 10th of February on page six of the meeting pack. Are members content that the uh, true reflection of the proceedings? Chair. Oh, yep. Emma, go on ahead. Just one thing, and apologies. I was late into the meeting. I couldn't get the, the link for some reason. Um, mm -hmm. I think I'm going to the junk. It was just on the meeting that we had had last week, the, the joint committee meeting. I think mm -hmm. we had agreed that we were going to commit to to a bit of joint work between our own committee and the the one that we state, and just to see where that was at. If, if we're kidding, I didn't notice that sort of reflected in the minutes, or maybe you're going to put it into the forward work program. Yeah, I have it for under any other business at the end, or just to take those various items uh, that were listed and just get the approval for them at that stage. <clears throat> so, yep, yeah, well, well spotted. It's good. Okay. Um, so, look, uh, members, on the basis of that, then we're happy to proceed with those minutes then. Uh, and that will allow us then to move on to item five, which is the uh, presentation from the Northern Ireland Youth Forum. Our sorry, to, oh, sorry, sorry, to, go ahead, Pat. sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I, I, I'm just not sure where to raise this issue, so I might as well raise it now. Um, it's in, in regard to the presentation by Shauna later on. Uh, in, in closed session. Now there are there's at least one issue in that presentation, or uh, connected to the presentation, that I think needs some public airing. So I'm just wondering where should we raise that? What part of the meeting? Um, okay. Um, do you want to do it in um, at any other business, which is just before we go into that section, and you could raise it at that point, and then um, I suppose 
Shauna won't be there for it. Well, she could maybe come on for that bit. Maybe uh, if there's a part of it that needs race, or if there's a bit of it that you think needs race, would it be too late to then take that item out and have it tabled separately for next week? Well, we we could raise it at any other business because I mean I don't think Shauna will have a, a response to it. It wouldn't be her position okay. to respond to the issue I'm raising. Uh, it's just it's it's a procedural issue that was agreed previously in terms of all the different elements of the structures and reporting back to the executive and then to the committee and so on. It hasn't happened. Okay. I just want to raise that. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, certainly, uh, maybe at any other business, you could say that you've noted the pe- presentation that comes up on something you want to ask is uh, and, and have it at that public part of the session, and then uh, we can take it from there. Okay. That'll do. Okay. That's great. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I was a couple of minutes. Okay, um, I was a couple of minutes late there, and um, I, I need to put an apology in for Trevor Clark. Uh, he has a, a policing board thing. He's a member of the policing board. He has a policing board thing to be dealing with this afternoon. So, if you could record that, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely, perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, Tibber. Okay, so. Uh, Vaughn then to item five, if all members are content and happy. And we'll move to the Northern Ireland Youth Forum presentation. Our voices speaking truth to power uh, presentation. And we'll get all of the members that are coming along to present today uh, to get move them up into the uh, spotlight. So we'll give the comms team a second or two to move people across. Okay, uh, still a few more to come in. So to the comms team, if they could move Blair up, perfect. I think we have everybody on board at this stage. Uh, You're all very welcome along today to the committee. We would, of course, uh, much prefer to have you in person. Uh, in the instalment in Parliament buildings to be able to to meet you there. Unfortunately, we're all speaking to you from our kitchens and dining rooms right across the north. So, uh, uh, we're, but we're delighted to have you along. I have been part of the political champions group, which has met with many of you on a regular basis and heard uh, firsthand uh, the, the the presentation that you're about to give. And I think it's an excellent opportunity and, and you're to be commended as a group of young people of stepping up and taking a leadership role uh, within uh, the community of actually asking the key questions about COVID and its impact upon young people right across Northern Ireland. And for getting such a big response, not to put a spoiler alert in there, but for getting such a big response, uh, it really does give real validity uh, to the presentation that you're about to give. And we're always uh, very lucky that many of these committee meetings are watched by uh, lots of key people. There will be quite a number of people out there uh, from the media world, uh, and I would really ask them to pay special attention to the information that you're about to present, because it really is such a coherent snapshot of what young people are thinking at the moment about uh, coronavirus and the response from the executive. Um, Normally, the things, Chris, uh, it's yourself that kind of does the liaison. Are you going to take the lead in this, or have you got somebody else to take the lead for, for this event? Um, I am going to hand over in a wee minute, just to make sure you can hear me okay, yes? Yeah, yeah, sure. Good, we can hear you. Yeah, I'll just say a very quick uh, hello, and I'm going to hand over to the young people, because, as you know, Colin, um that's how we do things in the youth forum. We like to we like to let young people take the lead, and we're very much here in the background to support that. But just from my perspective, a massive thank you to, for having us along today, and uh, thank you for your continued um, support through your role as a youth champion. Um, and I have no doubt that you'll be blown away by the young people. I just want to I just want to pay a quick word uh, of thanks to them. Interestingly, this group has never met in person which is really the sign of the times. We, we only realised this in the last couple of weeks when we were evaluating. So these young people have been working through COVID-19 
through, I can remember last St. Patrick's Day was probably when things kicked off um, and we started getting into lockdowns. But but this group of young people have been consistent. They've been meeting constantly online. They've been supported by Natalie and Lauren and other members of the Youth Forum, Forum staff. But I just pay a massive tribute to these young people because they're going through so much right now and they've given them so much time to develop this research and present to you. So really that's all I want to say for now. It's just a massive thank you to everyone involved. Um, and I'm going to hand over to OT, who is going to lead you through our presentation. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, fire on ahead. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Austin Tommaso Vahaly. I hopefully uh, you can hear me. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to presume you can hear me. I am Vice Chairperson of the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, which has been lobbying, advocating, fighting and promoting the voices of young people since its inception in 1979. I'm also a member of the NIYF or Voices subgroup, which has worked on three pieces of youth-led regional research into the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on, on young people. So I'm going to present a very brief outline of our key findings before passing over to the other or Voices members to speak personally on some of our key themes and asks. For a fuller breakdown of our research, I would encourage you all to read the Old Voices report, which we uh, published. So we created the surveys in recognition of the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a diverse range of impacts on young people, and we needed to find out what the arising needs of young people were. So across the three surveys, we have had 4,000 individual responses. The data we'll be sending now is from our most updated survey, which uh, occurred in November, and that had 2,500 responses. These surveys has allowed us to highlight the top issues identified by young people and the diverse range of their views, opinions, and thoughts. This information has then empowered us to create platforms for young people to have their voices heard by decision makers and adults in power, and importantly, hold them to account. This has included two live streamed events with a cross party group of NIYF political champions, which have had 5.8k individual views on social uh, media. Uh, next slide, please, Lauren. So, what do we find out? Well, some of our headline stats include the fact that 89% of respondents felt the voice of young people has not been heard throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. We presented a similar statistic to the Children's Commissioner for NI in August 2020 from one of our previous surveys, and she actually responded by saying she was surprised it wasn't higher. 74% of respondents also highlighted that they felt their mental health had deteriorated during the course of the pandemic. 55% of respondents say they did not fully understand restrictions, rules and regulations, which obviously can have a serious impact on safety. Finally, 45% of our survey respondents highlighted they did not feel safe in their learning environment or workplace. And of course, that is just not inducive to learning. Next slide, please, Lauren. So via the survey, we've been able to identify the top four issues for young people, which were mental health and well-being. That's 67% of young people identifying it. Uh, the joint first was concerns around education and learning at home and exams, and that was also at 67%. Isolation and loneliness was at 61%, and boredom came at 51%. Next slide, please. So as previously said, mental health and well-being was the joint top issue for young people at the time of the survey, followed closely with isolation and loneliness and boredom. It's of course clear to see how these issues interact and intersect to have a seriously negative impact on young people in these silencing times. Concerningly, the majority of young people also identified their mental health as having got worse over the course of the pandemic, and only 29% of respondents felt hopeful about the future. This is a very sad state for some of our young people to be in. Furthermore, 52% also feel they are not coping well with not seeing friends and family during the pandemic. That's certainly very understandable. 
we had an open box for comments or questions to be written uh, in our surveys and one young person between the age of 15 and 17 wanted the government to answer what are you going to do to improve the treatment of children with mental health conditions in NI when the CAM system can't even afford to take everyone that needs help right now when they need it? So I think that's a really powerful question uh, for a teenager to have to ask and I think it's probably a concern for many young people. Uh, funding was clearly inadequate to meet need b before the pandemic so how do we ensure that any additional need for support services uh, will be met as the pandemic uh, continues and eventually ends. Next slide. So when asked to describe how they were feeling in one word, young people's responses were pretty concerning with significant signs of distress. The three most common words chosen by young people were anxious, annoyed and frustrated. I think that speaks for itself. itself. Uh, next slide please. So again, concerns around education, learning from home, exams was a, a joint top issue for young people at the time of the survey with 67% identifying it. Uh, it was a diverse category and different issues relating to education include remote learning and the inequality of resources and connectivity, inconsistent teaching experiences with the pandemic, greater exam stress and confusion and a, a number of young people also felt unsafe in their schools uh, when they reopened. I would also be amiss not to mention that clearly some young people will be anxiously waiting for more information about the alternative, alternative arrangements for assessments this summer and, and how that will work. So uh, I know young people are anxiously waiting to get information on that. Again, in the open section of the survey, uh, one young person between the age of 11 and 14 wanted the government to answer, uh, uh, let, wanted the government to let the people in secondary school ask questions to help them understand what is going to happen in school. Clearly, this young person was a little conf confused about the school and the impact of COVID-19. I'm sure, and I think a lot of the people of youth form are sure that more meaningful consultation with young people about the educational issues that affect their lives and long-term long prospects would really help in this area. Next slide please Lauren. So with regards to the thoughts and views of young people, 52% of survey respondents asked questions about the topics of lockdown, information, health, vaccines and testing. A staggering 10% of survey respondents also selected food, feeling unsafe at home, housing rights and homelessness as one of the top issues facing them at the time of surveying. Um, this latter statistic is really sad and I think it highlights that the most vulnerable young people have been deeply affected by this pandemic. So these are complex and multifaceted issue, but clearly what one of um, you know the issues affecting it is that existing support mechanisms have become disrupted due to the pandemic and that puts young people at risk. We have to do better. Uh, I just truly think that no young person uh, in NI should be struggling with the most basic human needs. Uh, it's, it's not acceptable and, and, and I think we can do better. Next slide. So finally, youth voice and participation. This is really the bread and butter of the youth forum. We are all about empowering young people to have their voices heard. When surveyed, over 80% of respondents felt the voice of young people has not been heard during the COVID-19 pandemic. 74% of respondents also felt they did not have faith and confidence in leadership from government. We didn't actually specify if government, government was the NI executive or Westminster, so we don't know about that, but it was just the general feeling among young people about the governance uh, regarding COVID-19. Another concerning statistic is that 58% of those surveys did not fully understand the messages from people in Poyo. This is something that really links to, um, I think we've sort of talked about before at NIYF, which is the creation of a singular, accessible, youth-friendly information source for updates regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. We can't blame young people for not understanding complex health messages. Instead, we have to work to make them clearer. We know misinformation and confusion can cost lives. One quote uh, we have on the topic of youth voice and participation uh, came from a young person between the ages of 15 and 17 who wanted to ask the government, 
Do you ever really think of the impact of your decisions that you make have on young people? I would ask this because as a young person, it feels as if politicians do not take into consideration that they might be affecting young people. Clearly, this young person felt their needs are not being taken into account by decision makers and is expressing frustration on that. And that's my portion of the presentation complete. So uh, thank you very much for listening. And of course, uh, thank you for uh, extending an invite for us to present to you today. Um, I will now be passing over to the other Old Voices group members to speak more personally on some of our key themes and recommendations from our research. Uh, Jack is first, who will be discussing education. So uh, go ahead, Jack. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm 14 and I'm from Arden, North Down Borough Council. I've been involved with the Northern Ireland Youth Forum for two years and I've been a part of the Arden North Down Youth Council since. Last March, I joined the Our Voices group and I've been involved in all three surveys. In, in school, I'm in year 10 and picking my GCSEs this year. Usually in school, we would have a careers week where our parents would come in and talk to our careers teacher and speak to the teachers of the subjects we would like to continue. Although this year it will all be online and we won't be able to have as much communication with our teachers so we can ask about our choices. On top of this, our teachers are expecting us to produce the same amount of work and at the same quality that we would if we were still in school. Throughout the pandemic, education has remained a top issue for young people. 45% of survey respondents voiced that they felt unsafe in their workspace or education environment. 35% of questions asked by the survey respondents were around the topic of education. Some key issues for young people were around exams, widening inequalities such as young people not having appropriate resources for homeschooling, the digital divide, the varying levels of interaction and engagement from schools to parents and students, and the pressures parents and carers are under to homeschool. Young people have expressed anxiety around the inconsistencies of the grading system. Some young people feel that it would be unfair to repeat the year if they have done well in the exams or teacher gradings. However, other young people feel that repeating the year would be beneficial for their learning, especially if they have not had a positive learning experience or support during the pandemic. Young people feel that a choice should be given to parents and students on whether they would like to continue to the next year or repeat the year that they are in. Young people who are at university are having an extremely different experience than expected. Issues raised by students include private rental accommodation and the expectation to pay rent when they have returned home. It was welcome that students receive a £500 one-off payment. However, this is only temporarily alleviating worries. Our key asks. We would ask the Executive Office Committee to support our request to meet the Education Committee and the Minister of Education to further present these key issues for students across Northern Ireland and speak to relevant organisations. I would also like to highlight young people who attend university often have part-time jobs in the hospitality sector and are on zero hour contracts. Students are struggling financially. What specifically is the Ed Executive Office Committee going to doing to support students financially in the long term. The Our Voices group had two meetings scheduled to meet the Minister of Economy. However, they were both cancelled at the last minute by the Minister. Could the Executive Committee create a platform for students to have their voice heard? I will now pass to Blair. Hi, um, I'm Blair, I'm 26 and I'm from Balmina. I was extremely nervous um, coming here today and this is because I'm getting the opportunity to present an arena which influences the chance, the chance for change that affects our next generation. Knowing the impact that this could have down the line, engaging with and working with groups and hopefully seeing the change of young people's voices being included and being able to take this back to our young people and seeing the wider effect that this may have. I am one of the two peer mentors within NAYF and I've been involved for over two years. I, have, I came from participating on Amplify um, to becoming a peer mentor. I play a big part in participating and advocating for change, setting the Central Housing Forum, Welfare Reform Working Group and the Digital Inclusions, just to name a few. COVID-19 has greatly impacted me throughout this year. It has placed a hold on me moving on with my career. It has placed pressures on me I never thought I would have experienced prior to COVID. It has caused me stress and challenged me as a parent. The uncertainty and fear that set in around how I plan and put things in place, how I advise my child on how to, be, how to best make choices for her high school, knowing that this will affect the rest of her childhood and overall impact her adult life. 
not knowing how I gain or where I gain information from regarding her homeschooling and schooling in general. I'm feeling like I'm failing her as a parent, as it's my job to help support and advise her in the best process, which I don't even know how to do. It has greatly impacted on how I want to plan and vision my next year. Throughout the process of our research, we have gathered nearly 4,000 res individual responses from young people throughout the region. Whilst there have been themes that have emerged from our findings, such as mental health, education and youth voice, we feel it is important to know that these are not the only issues impacting young people right now. 10% of young people reported that their issues are food, feeling unsafe within their homes, housing rights and homelessness. Our survey's age range was between 11 and 25, meaning young people as, as young as 11 could be experiencing these issues expressed. Bear in mind that these issues have always been here. However, they are now heightened ma massively, given the impact it affect COVID-19 has had on many families, young people and people in general. The harsh reality is many of our young people are experiencing difficult circumstances and have nowhere to turn. Accessing a food bank can only happen three times. You must be referred for this process, which young people cannot benefit from by themselves. Young people have told us that they do not feel safe within their own homes, are experiencing homelessness or are worried about their housing rights. Given my own personal experiences, I know firsthand the impact that this has on their overall mental health, well-being and daily living. When services are not able to provide the best service possible, COVID has now given this a greater impact with greater need. Not having a safe space or not feeling safe within your own home setting gives challenges and challenges aspects of a young person's life. It all starts at home. Feeling safe and secure, loved and wanted, fed and warm, young people often thrive and don't need or need to feel of any type of the system. Unfortunately, when this isn't the case, too often young people struggle dealing with these emotions and can end up needing extra support, support that isn't currently available. Often we think young people facing these issues are over the age of 18, but the reality is these children and young people are as young as 11 and possibly younger. These are our basic human rights that young people are entitled to have. Young people in Northern Ireland are living in poverty right now, are frightened for the future and are extremely vulnerable. Our key asks, the Trustle Trust recently reported that food banks in Northern Ireland have seen an increase in the need of support of families and young people, with a 142% increase in the number of people fed. With UNCRC Article 6 in mind states, Parties recognise that every child has the right to inherit of life and states parties shall ensure the maximum extent possible of survival and development for the child. Can we get a commitment from the Executive Office Committee to ensure you are doing everything in your power to make sure young people's basic human rights are met and upheld and policies are reviewed through the lens of the impact of COVID-19? It is vital that young people have a choice at all decision-making levels. Can we ask that the Executive Office Committee to review how the NI Assembly seek to review young people to ensure their voices are listened to on the issues affecting their lives? Thank you. I will write past OT. Apologies, OT. No, no problem. So, hi everyone again. I'm actually a massive athlete. I, I'm very safe at NIYF. I've also done too many programs with them, but um, they are amazing. So, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm also a student at Queen's University of Belfast. I'm going to talk a little further about mental health and isolation. So, before the pandemic, mental health has been consistently identified as a key issue that young people have struggled with. Indeed, in February 2020, NIYF organised a summit bringing together politicians, young people, adults, youth workers and more to highlight the issue of mental health and wellbeing and how it is affecting children and young people. We heard the experience of a youth worker who had to try and support a young person in crisis who was sent away from A&E with little more than a lifeline card. We heard the powerful words of a family member who had lost a young person to suicide. We heard the experiences of people who failed to get adequate support via the statutory mental health services, whether that be the child and adolescent mental health services or adult mental health. That was, of course, if they were lucky enough to get the support uh, due to such long waiting lists. We're not in any way disparaging the mental health professionals who do amazing work to support people, 
Rather, we are saying that on many occasions, demand simply overpowers capacity and more has to be done. So we know mental health was a key issue before the pandemic. I know we have to add on all the issues regarding COVID-19 that can have an impact on mental health and well-being. Whatever your position in life, the majority of us have experienced some form of worry and stress, whether it be with regards to the physical danger of COVID-19, financial losses, educational issues, social isolation, or the disruption of services that support well-being and more. This pandemic has exacerbated mental health issues, and we know that. As previously mentioned, when survey respondents were asked about the impact of COVID-19 on their mental health, 76% voiced it has gotten worse or much worse. These young people deserve the support they need. In 2016, it was estimated that 45,000 children and young people in NI have had um, have a mental health problem, and it was before the pandemic. I am very afraid, afraid for the most vulnerable young people. They need support and they need it now. Figures obtained by the IS News and published on the 15th of February showed that a total of 1,310 children and adolescents were on health trust waiting lists for mental health support as of December 2020. Each one of those numbers represents a real young person who is struggling and had the confidence to ask for support. Neither on a waiting list. The longest wait reported in that article was at the Western Trust at, at a figure of 282 days and another at the Belfast Trust, which was 238 days. I don't know in what world that would be okay. I really don't. I know these are the longest figures and they might not be representative, representative of everyone's experiences, but again, these are individual young people who needed support and had to wait 282 days for help. It's truly absurd that young people have waited that long for the help they need and the help they deserve. It's not good enough. So where do we go from here? Well, firstly, it's clear we need increased funding for mental health services, both child and adolescent mental health services and adult mental health. Many similar issues are in both services, and we would encourage the committee to do anything they can to help make that a reality. We also welcome the announcement of a 300 million uh, point funding burst to help tackle COVID-19 and, and the encouragement of the Chief Secretary of the Treasury who, who stated, I would urge the Executive to use this additional 300 million to help those most in need in NI. We would like to ask the Committee for the Executive Office to consider lobbying, to consider lobbying the Health Minister around its funding burst. Please encourage him to put in a bid for some of this money to be used to help support the voluntary and statutory sector in delivering vital mental health and well-being services. We know the skills, we know professionals have the skills to support young people and they need the funding to make that happen. I have seen firsthand the great work of voluntary organisations that can make a big difference in young people, people's lives and the statutory sector, but funding is necessary. We need to be able to meet the demand. Schools is also a big issue. Um, the interim mental health champion, Savon O'Neill, recently presented to the Education Committee around the possibility of mental health assessments uh, for all pupils ahead of their return to school. And it is something uh, we would support. I think it's a great idea. We can't go straight back to business as usual. Young people need additional support and uh, we need to be able to see if certain young people need extra support. We can't just throw them back into the classroom without knowing that they may have additional needs that they didn't have before the pandemic. I would also like to mention the Elephant in the Room campaign, which is a youth-led mental health campaign by the Northern Ireland Youth Forum and Belfast Youth Forum. We are happy to say that it, uh, the campaign has had a lot of engagement with decision makers and I think that's a great thing and we thank them for it. Uh, some of the key asks from this campaign include the creation of a compulsory, meaningful and long-term mental health and wellbeing curriculum for all schools in NI. It would help raise awareness of mental health, tackle stigma and ensure that young people have access to high quality, consistent mental health information. That has the potential to save lives. In addition, if a program like this is implemented correctly, it could actually help young people develop positive coping mechanisms and resilience to use in times of distress. Mental health shouldn't be something we ignore until it's a crisis point. 
Another key ask in this campaign is increased provision of mental health and wellbeing training for all teachers so they can have um, the knowledge to recognise signs of poor mental health in young people and to ensure a comprehensive mental health curriculum can be de delivered effectively. These measures were essential before COVID-19 and I think the impact of COVID-19 on young, young people's mental health so ho 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 even more necessary uh, these measures are annoying. We would ask the executive, uh, uh, the committee for the executive office, to commit to lobbying the education minister around implementing the measures above. I would also encourage the committee for the executive office to uh, check out the elephant in the room uh, campaign report. Um, it's a little older now, but uh, a lot of stuff still hasn't been done and is still very relevant. And we very much uh, like like to put that information on too. I would also say, look, I like to, I want to acknowledge some great steps forward that have happened. Um, the Department of Health uh, Mental Health Action Plan is a great step forward, and the appointment into a mental health sampling for Northern Ireland. Again, that's great. But what we're here today is say that more has to be done. You know, those those waiting list figures that were published on the fifteenth were really shocking, and it, and I and I, I worry for those so do not. I really do. So uh, thank you so much for listening. I will now pass over to Adam. Hi there. Um, I'd just like to start by saying thank you very much for giving us and the informed opportunity to speak here today. Um, my name is Adam. I'm 18. I'm from Bangor. And like OT, I'm a student at Queen's University. I'm first year. I'm living at home at the moment, and I've got a part-time job to help fund my degree. I'm involved as a member of the Youth Forum and the Origin North Town Youth Council, and also the Art Voices group that's here today. I previously had the opportunity to participate in youth forum discussions with the Education Committee and Education Minister, which I'm very thankful for. As with most people, COVID has negatively impacted me, mainly through my university experience. Socially, COVID has limited the opportunities I have to meet new people and enjoy the traditional university first year experience. I chose to stay at home, and many students I know have done the same. From my experience, being a, being a university student has been a lonely one. Although Queen's has done a great job of offering online events for students to network and make new friends, the experience isn't the same. COVID has diluted the university experience in the laptop. Academically, COVID has limited the teaching methods available to all students, hindering learning experience. While COVID has brought unprecedented challenges, it's given unprecedented opportunities as well. Personally, I would never have imagined speaking to the Education Committee or this committee today. I'd like to thank the executive and those in government for the, for the successful steps they've already taken to combat the pandemic. Regarding Youth Voice, the NIU Youth Forum have had the opportunity to speak to decision makers at Stormont, such as the Education Committee and the Education Minister, and those meetings have been invaluable. More successes can be made if young people are more involved in the decision making processes. And while COVID has affected all ages, young people will inherit the economic. The UK economy faced an almost double digit recession in 2020 and the social consequences of the pandemic most severely. Therefore, the lack of youth voice has been one of the key issues for young people throughout the pandemic. There have been excellent opportunities for youth participation in government, as previously mentioned. However, we often haven't been able to promote, promote the voice of young people to the extent that we need. For example, a meeting between the NIU Forum and the Economy Minister, as previously mentioned, was postponed twice, and this meeting now appears to be in limbo. Instances like these have happened previously, with the Youth Press Conference facing the first and Deputy First Minister proposed by the Youth Forum, happening in a similar format as those experienced in countries like Norway, being placed, to the way, being placed to the wayside. This Youth Press Conference has been lobbied for by the Youth Forum since the start of the pandemic, with subsequent letters from NOAF political champions requesting this also. These efforts were, were met with no acknowledgement, but instead a subsequent Cool FM Youth, youth Press meeting carried out in December with the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. While we're thankful this happened, this briefing had a small runtime and a limited amount of young people. Regarding this conference, the Northern Ireland Youth Forum are calling for a youth conference with wider youth population. This would be in partnership with relevant organisations to ensure that most vulnerable, young, most vulnerable youth voices, as mentioned before, those in poverty, those really struggling, can be heard. It is important to us that we engage with, with as many young people as possible. While the announcement of the Youth Assembly in June 2020 is welcome, Youth Voice is essential for cooperation, but also for the rights of young people. As previously mentioned, 
this pandemic will perennially impact young people. As outlined under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in Article 12, young people have a right to have their voices heard about decisions that impact their lives. Ultimately, COVID offers unprecedented opportunities for cooperation. It has led to further opportunity for reflection on how we live our lives and offers the chance for change. This change can be achieved with sustained future consultation between young people and government. So what are our key asks? Can we have a commitment today from the Executive Office Committee to ensure that a youth press conference is rescheduled as a matter of urgency in line with UNCRC Article 12, so that young people have a right to have a say about decisions that affect their lives? Additionally, 74% of our survey respondents have expressed they do not have faith and confidence in leadership from government, as previously mentioned. Can we ask the Executive Office Committee how are you meaningfully engaging with young people now and seeking their views, thoughts and opinions about the important decisions that impact their lives? This will not only benefit young people, but also those in government, so decisions that they make are followed by young people. In conclusion, thank you very much for giving the, the Northern Ireland Youth Forum the opportunity to speak to those gathered here today. Thank you for listening. I hope that this cooperation between young people and government illustrated here today will continue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is that, uh, can I just, I'll just confirm, is that, that you finished up or is anybody else? Uh, she's finished up, perfect. Okay, um, listen, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, one of the things that I, I like most about it is, it's what it should be. It's turned things upside down, because normally in presentations, people come in and then the committee asks the questions. And I just love the fact that you've left us with a whole list of questions. And, and I do think that that's the way that it should be because I do think that young people are often overlooked and that their voices aren't heard. And you today uh, have between you, and, and that's through Oshin, through Adam, Jack, Blair, and Lauren, you have provided um, a clear and articulate and informed voices from yourselves, but you're representing 4,000 voices that's the voices that you're actually saying. And we need to be listening to you today like it's 4,000 people in front of us that are asking these things because that's the validity of the piece of work that you have carried out. And when we hear terms like anxious and annoyed and frustrated as being the key words that our people are feeling, if that isn't a call to action by an executive and, and political representative, then I don't know what we uh, are here to do. We must be responding to these issues. And you have left us with, a, you know, I've, I've been keeping a note of them and I know uh, some of the clerks will have been doing that as well of the very specific questions. And what we'll do afterwards is where you've said, will the executive office ask the education minister or ask the economy minister, we will write to those ministers and say that having listened to your presentation, that we now have these series of questions and those answers that we want to have. I know as well um, that there was a meeting that was planned between the, the political champions group and the first and deputy first minister from last July. Um, and I know that that didn't take place uh, and that in somehow or another it has fallen by the wayside. Just to update members that last week I met with the first and deputy first minister and they have given an assurance that they will come along and meet. So I will make sure that we work with Chris uh, offline after this to make sure that that meeting takes place and um, maybe with some of yourselves as well. Um, I would say that I would be, uh, and I'll lay this down as a challenge, I would be shocked and disappointed if we can't have uh, a youth press conference because it needs to be sorted. There are many, many views that young people have. They want to be able to legitimately ask the questions. And I think it should be just the way that the normal press conference happens. And by that, again, I set down the challenge, which is that you don't submit your questions beforehand. Journalists don't submit their questions beforehand uh, so that they get them cleared and the answers prepared. Uh, so I think that the young people that take part in that press conference should be able to ask exactly just like regular journalists the question that they want and to be able to get the answers that they would like to hear. Um, Maybe if I could ask just one question and then I'll pass on to my colleagues in the committee. Um, and really the question is, 
how do you, you have asked us like how can we encourage and ensure that the voices of young people are heard but have you got an idea of how that could be done best what are your thoughts on how the voices of young people could be heard um, and what would be the best way to try and hear what young people are thinking because I'm sure you are full of ideas so does anybody maybe got some questions on, on how they feel youth voices could be heard in the future going forward Maybe Ashwin, um, do you want to either take that or pass it out to somebody? Um, I think Adam actually wanted to take that, but um, I'm just going to say it, it sort of links it links to it, and and we mentioned it in the survey. Look, meaningful consultation, and it is not a, like a one size fits all. Like we do the youth uh, press conference, and then that's it. No, it's about meaningful, continuous consultation to ensure that young people have a say on every issue that affects their lives. It's really that. Um, uh, simple and meaningful consultation can can take different forms. Um, one thing we also have talked about, uh, which is sort of related to this, is the idea of youth friendly information of COVID. Um, when we were in a, a meeting with the Minister of State for NI and we said, look, we think this would be youth friendly information, one information source for young people to go to so they can know what's happening with COVID. He said, that's a great idea. Maybe you should do that. Um, of course, we can't do that necessarily on the basis of we would be interpreting uh, uh, regulations and, and there's issues with that but we would love to have a partnership with the executive mm -hmm. and when they release new regulations we can come in and we can uh, create a, a document that's clear concise for young people because uh, we hear that a lot that young people just don't understand and it's being worded in ways that are confusing but if we can simplify that in a way that's suitable for all age groups that really saves lives but i'm going to let adam jump in there because i know adam adam wanted to actually i sort of i went okay. off topic there a little bit um adam do you want to jump in on that yeah yes please um i agree with all the points that ot said i just like to emphasize the youth assembly i think that's a great way of meaningful and sustained cooperation going forward I know that it was announced in June 2020, and obviously with this pandemic, the actual ways and means to create this assembly has been severely hindered and limited, but I think that is a great way of sustained cooperation going forward. It shouldn't have to be that we put out a survey that young people can actually say, the 4,000 young people can come to us and say, this is how I'm feeling. It shouldn't be a survey. It should be people coming to people and saying, this is how I'm feeling. Can you maybe put it to youth assembly? And then that goes to government that way. I think that is a really amazing way of sustained cooperation going forward. And I hope that means, well, I hope that can be put into effect in the future, hopefully, once COVID kind of dies down a bit. Um, I think Chris wanted to comment on as well. Yeah, thanks, Adam. And just to note, um, I was in a meeting this morning with the Speaker of the Assembly and other uh, people involved in youth participation with regards to the establishment of the youth assembly. So it's been a long road. We've been lobbying for 13 years, but we're, the, the hope is that uh, something will be set up there by, by spring, summer time. Um, but just to, just to go back to your question, Colin, about, about youth voice, I suppose for me, and sorry for being a bit of a negative wizard, but I, whilst I welcome the idea of a, a youth press conference, I, I have to admit that I do feel that it needs to be more than that. You know, the the authentic youth voice needs to be a more sustained approach and it needs to be something that is ongoing because you know yourself, COVID-19, the, the, the landscape changes sometimes daily, uh, weekly. Every time you turn on the radio, watch the news, it could be exams, it could be 11 plus was in the news and uh, um, you know, there's day after day, week after week, things change. So I, I from, a, from, a, from my perspective, I would be arguing for something more sustained, for more engagements like this. And I think that we've seen great success through the Political Youth Champions Group and young people sitting down regularly with MLAs. Um, so I suppose my ask from, from my perspective is that that engagement would be sustained and ongoing. Um, so thank you, Adam, for, for bringing me in there. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and I suppose that, you know, it's you, you'll pick lots of different things up with engagement, and I think that's important. And, and I'm sorry for picking one, but there's just one that's going to, that, you know, one that's just jumping straight into my head. And it was one that Adam had said, you know, how, you, you know, because of COVID, you know, your university experience has been um, sort of condensed down to that of a laptop. I mean, that, you know, everybody understands it's been the university, what the university experience is, but now I understand for a lot of young people that that's simply going to be, uh, you know, opening a laptop every day or hearing that there are 10% of people that are concerned about food or their safety. 
I mean, these are the sort of things that we need to be highlighting and pushing out there. And it's taken you to come in here today to be able to actually raise those points and raise those issues. But look, I'm going to move on to the other committee members. I can see from my screen here that a number of them have indicated that they want to ask a few questions. So I'll go first to the deputy chair of the committee and ask Doug Beatty to be brought up into the spotlight, please. And then Doug will ask a question. And then um, I think maybe the easiest way sometimes for these, maybe Austin, can we pick on you as you started? If we direct the question to you and then you don't need the answer, but if you could appoint somebody to answer, it just keeps the, the flow whenever we're not in the same room. It helps it to run a bit easier. So we'll get Doug on to ask his question. If the, the comms team can move him up there into the spotlight first. There we go. So Doug, we'll pass over to yourself. Brilliant. Sure. Thank you very much. And can I just say, uh, I, I really enjoyed that. I thought that was uh, fascinating. Uh, it was incredibly informative. Um, I thought it was thought provoking as well. And, and I think I'm gonna, there's an awful lot that, that I want to take away from this, actually. I, I, uh, there's questions I need to ask myself and there, there's, there's challenges that need to go out to, to some people who I work with and, and I know. Um, but in the same respect, I, I think if I'm Honest with all of you here, you know, I, if I respect you all, I, I can't be patronising with you. You know, uh, I, I have to be challenging with you as well, um, and and I want to try and do that, and just try and keep, unpick some of the issues that that, that you mentioned, um, because see, sitting here today and and yesterday and tomorrow, uh, I feel anxious and I feel annoyed uh, and I feel frustrated, um, uh, and all of the issues that you did in your survey, the mental health, the isolation and loneliness, the boredom, the education, learning and home exams, they, they affect everybody. They affect society. Um, you know, if I talk to parents who are doing homeschooling, uh, they are anxious, annoyed and frustrated. So they have that um, also. Uh, and when you say 74% have no faith or confidence in the government and leadership, I'm telling you now, if you go to the adult population, it's it's greater than that. Um, uh, and likewise, 58% uh, don't fully understand messages from the people in power. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a huge issue. So so I guess my my first question is this: If somebody wants to take it on, is how do you measure your concerns within this youth groupings? Um, from the concerns which are just everyday concerns that you will have when you move into uh, an adult sort of um, uh, environment or, or or move on and get older in life? Um, I'm going to pass over to Chris Crenn on that one. He would like to answer it. Chris, do you want to go ahead? Sure, OT, thank you. Listen, and if anyone else wants to come in, just give me a signal. I think, Doug, look, your, your points are very valid. Like, this is a... This is affecting everyone, regardless of age. You know, it doesn't it doesn't discriminate. There's no there's no doubt. I can't I can't sit and we can't sit and argue about that. I guess some of the things that we have uh, been acutely aware of during the pandemic, um, given our role, is, is how it's affecting young people. So I can give you one statistic that we've recently been given sight of, and and it's the the fact that eighteen to twenty five year old single males and females are perhaps some of the most vulnerable in terms of becoming homeless or having uh, issues re with regards to relationship break breakdown and their domestic setting change. And so the increase in homelessness and young people uh, who are now in temporary accommodation amongst that age band has increased 500% during the pandemic. So that, that's quite startling. Um, the, the, the statistics that OT was telling you around um, mental Ill health, and again, you know, I'm a big advocate in personal life and, and professional life about how this affects everyone. I think we're told one in four people are affected, but what we are seeing in our practice, Doug, is that more and more young people are presenting in crisis. Um, and because, I guess, because of the way COVID has pushed us behind a screen, availing people, people of that support is very difficult right now. Um, but we're finding that that is particularly um, difficult for young, younger people, um, particularly because um, for, for different reasons, you know, um, lack of connection to support networks, not knowing where to go to for help, feel embarrassed to ask for help. Um, so I, I do take on board your points, though, that yes, this is affecting everyone. 
Um, and and there, there's no doubt, young, old. Uh, I mean, my my Grammy is night was ninety this year, and and she she's afraid to leave her, her home, and she didn't come to our house for Christmas dinner. You know, so there's no there's no doubt that it's affecting all of us. Um, but our uh, our, our research is, is showing that young people are are, are acutely um, a, acutely uh, affected by this, and, and those homelessness statistics are one indicator. Um, I don't know, OT. I'm gonna. I don't know if anyone else wants to come back. Can, you Can I just jump in? And maybe that maybe that'll help if 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 other people then uh, on this question. I think it's a really really important because what you've just said to me, which is a great answer by the way, is the issue that our younger people don't have coping mechanisms, uh, and therefore what we need to try and do is build in coping me mechanisms for a, for a, at a younger age, um, because I know we talked about. How do we get teachers to act as mental health risk managers, to speak? But the question is, do they have the capacity to do that? So is this something around trying to create uh, an education to give people coping mechanisms? Is that, is that a, fair, a fair analysis? Look, I, I'll just jump in and I'd say, look, that's, I think that's a really big part of it. And that's one of the things we've been asking for. Uh, at NIYF through the Elephant in the Room campaign is that, um, again, one of the reasons why young people have found it so difficult is they're going through a developmental process. They haven't developed these coping mechanisms maybe as much as an adult would. And actually, there's very little direct support to develop these in the current institutions. It's about your A-levels. It's about the GCSEs. It's about getting through those things. But then for no fault of teachers or anything, we don't focus on, okay, how do we build resilience? And how do we tell young people what do I do in crisis? How do I cope with these silences we're facing? And so young people haven't had that education and they're facing a giant silence with uh, less support. And so, you know, we're saying one of the demands that we put in the Elephant in the Room campaign is let's have a comprehensive mental health curriculum that highlights a bit stigma, that highlights information that says, let's, whatever age you are, you can develop positive coping mechanisms suitable for that age group. But we don't have that provision in schools. But if we train teachers and we commit money to doing so, then actually that will help young people a lot. And it's, and it's a big one that we um, uh, talk, uh, talk about. So look, I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a great thing. Um, I just saw Adam would like to jump in on that quickly, so I'm gonna pass to him. But but yes, it's a really good point and, and one we're talking about. And again, with regards to adults struggling, I think it's right. You know, when we ran our mental health event, we had adults come to that event and say, "I'm on a waiting list and I can't get support." So actually, we need to commit more funding for mental health and wellbeing services. You know, because those waiting list statistics, I was shocked when I read them and I really wanted to put them to people to say, look, we need more funding on that. But it's not just let's commit to mental health services. It's a comprehensive approach. And that's what we're really asking for. So that's a really good point. I'm going to talk to Adam here because he just wanted to jump in on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. I, I, I completely agree with your point that it is everyone that's affected by it. I work at Tesco and just speaking to customers, it is some of the old elderly people, some of the people we are, I don't know, middle age that are affected by it as well. And you hear them and you hear their stories and you feel for them because you know, as a young person yourself, you're going through that. But I think in regards to the faith in government and a lack of faith in adults and in the youth, I think if we set up as a young person, uh, we set up now cooperation between young people and government going forward. And when, when those young people develop into adults, they will think I was listened to now, so I'll be listened to in future. I think it's tackling the issues now that young people face so when they become adults in society that they go this government has listened to me i feel confidence in them i have faith in them and i think some of the issues in mental health as well if you tackle an issue with it if you tackle a young person's mental health problems now as they grow up they will be more resilient and they will have the skills to combat everyday life as an adult um listen th thank you very much I, I mean i think that was a really good answer and and I'm just at the end there, can I just commend you for your sense of empathy uh, with everybody and the way you described that, which is a real life experience. I, I mean, I thought it was a, a good answer and, I, and, and, and it absolutely tells me exactly the point that you are, you are making here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Doug, and thank you to the panel for those answers. I'll bring up next then um, Pat Sheehan, please. If we can bring Pat up into the spotlight, we'll give him an opportunity to ask the question. Uh, and again, I've seen if you maybe direct it to whoever you think is best to, to answer that question. So we'll pass over to yourself, Pat. 
Thank you, Chair, and thanks to all of you for your presentation here today. Um, I'm also on the Education Committee, and OT, you mentioned uh, Professor Siobhan O'Neill giving evidence to the committee a couple of weeks ago. And what she said, uh, James, with what is in your survey, that there are a large number of young people who are have been significantly affected by this pandemic and who are suffering in regard to their emotional uh, well-being and psychological well-being. And I have been uh, arguing that the education minister needs to put in place a, a coherent, coordinated and integrated strategy to deal with the problems that our young people are facing. Because young young people are going to be uh, uh, facing these difficulties. Some are going to be falling behind in their learning because of difficulties with the remote learning at the minute. Uh, and there are issues around physical exercise which can help. So there needs to be a cross-departmental approach. The lead taken by education, but health involved, maybe communities involved and so on. Uh, we need to incorporate the skills and expertise out in the community and voluntary sector. We need to involve sporting bodies like the IFA, GAA, Ulster Rugby, and so on. But, I mean, I have to say, this isn't the sort of something we'll develop, we need to develop over five years. This needs to be done uh, and, and, and done now. I mean, if 74% of young people uh, are saying that their mental health has deteriorated, uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, this is this is urgent, uh, and and we're facing an, an unprecedented crisis that demands an unprecedented response. And you'll be aware that uh, there's now a, an extra three hundred million available for the COVID response uh, that uh, was thought initially might have to go back to the British Treasury, and in the education. Uh, uh, committee this morning, we uh, agreed to write to the education minister and ask him to make a bid and an ambitious bid for some of that funding. But really, I suppose what I, what I want to ask you is, I mean, would you be in agreement with this type of approach of an integrated strategy? And if you are, is there anything in particular you would like to see in it? Thanks. Um, I'm going to pass over to Chris for this one, but I would say, yeah, look, that's a big one. We we do a lot of cross de departmental work, and it's not just it, it's not just about okay, if we fund cams, then we don't have any proper you know mental health education in schools. We 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 should involve the really talented people in statutory and and volunteer services who do great work. So it's about a holistic approach, and we agree with that. Um, and when we talk about that, you know, we, we, we did actually, Elephant of Room did engage with uh, Siobhan O'Neill and every time we talk about it, people are in, in agreement and they say, look, this is very, very few people will say, no, we don't think there should be a mental health curriculum in schools to support young people. We shouldn't have a more holistic approach for mental health. So people always agree and then very little happens. And I think if COVID-19 doesn't uh, put us into action, no, I don't think it will ever happen. This is the time where people really need to know it. Um, and I would hope that the challenges we're facing only, it's the time to actually, okay, we've agreed on it. We've talked about it a lot. Let's actually get it done. Um, and I'm going to pass on to Chris because I know he does a lot of cross departmental work in there. Yeah, thank you, OT. And thanks, Pat, for the question. I think, I think there's quite a lot in that question, actually. There's probably there's probably a few different chunks that I want to try to address. And again, young people, please come in and, and pull me back if I'm, if I'm talking too much. But I think in terms of where we're at, I do agree with you. We need some sort of radical uh, approach to this. Um, I think with regards to mental ill health, what we're being told, a lot of statutory agencies, Pat, are telling us that they're predicting a mental health tsunami come the third quarter of next year. So we're we're in the middle of a, a recession. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're, not, we're this is un, unprecedented in, in 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 anyone's lifetime. I'm I'm assuming. Um, I, I don't know. I didn't live through the world wars. I don't know if if it was anything like this. But 
I think as a as a society, this has really taken a massive toll. Um, so even prior to COVID nineteen, mental health was a huge issue. Um, we talked last January. We had a, a, an emergency meeting because people were finding things so hard, and that was pre COVID. Um, and we had talked about how the mental health strategy just wasn't cutting it. You know, and we we needed to to look at that again. Um, in terms of education, um. In terms of all these things, I have to say, as a as a member of society and as a parent and as a a youth worker and a third sector leader, I'm very very worried. And you know, I, I just I think that what's going on with our young people in terms of their mental health and physical health, it makes me really sad. Actually, um, I think in terms of education, um, and I think the education committee is a great vehicle actually to have some of these really tough conversations. My own personal opinion is that young people, children and young people should have the option to repeat this year. Um, I think we start school too early in in this society. Uh, and I think if you look at other other places and how they do things, at the at the other end of the school year, uh, your school life, there's a there's an opportunity for, for transition years. Um I'm just looking at my own children and I'm wondering what they're losing out on um, in terms of literacy and numeracy, in terms of going on to the next level in their in their lives educationally. I think we need a really urgent conversation with the Minister for Education about what what can we do? What what can we do in terms of radically addressing this issue? Um, and then the issue about cross cross departmental working. Um, I've been involved in some conversations with through youth services, the youth services, about how we need to drill down on this. And I know there was a children's uh, services cooperation act that went through the assembly in the last couple of years which sort of speaks to that but that i mean that's very well but i think it's about action now. it's about how do we how do we respond to this crisis um and adam did say earlier you know we we are trying politicians are trying ministers are trying and it's no easy feat but i, I do think pat there's there's a real need for a real radical um look at this and i think the education committee would be a good starting point because i know some of the unions are speaking out, teachers' unions are speaking out about this now, and I think we need to do it urgently. We can't wait. We really can't wait. Yeah. Th th thanks for that, Chris. And obviously there's a lot there that I, I agree with. And just I'm, I'm just new on to the Education Committee, and I was asking officials last week about funding that had been made available since the first lockdown in, in the spring. And, you know, there was $5 million for the Engage programme, there was five million for something else. There was one point five for another matter, and it, it just seemed all very disjointed. And even when you think about it, five million might sound like a lot, but when you divide it between a thousand schools uh, and how many ever hundred thousand uh, school children there are, and it was also targeted at at teaching staff as well. So, uh, I mean. That's why I agree with you. We need a radical response. Uh, and just on, on the general issue of, of mental health, and I agree, the uh, the waiting lists are an absolute disaster. Uh, and, and we have been arguing for a long time uh, about ensuring parity of funding for mental health and physical health within the, uh, within the health and social care service. So that's an issue that needs to be fast forwarded by the minister. Uh, I mean, I understand we, the difficulties we we face with the pandemic at the minute, but we can't allow everything else to fall back because of this pandemic. There are issues that can be dealt with and dealt with quickly, and mental health is one of those issues. Could I just, Chair, if you'll indulge me for one minute, I just want to comment rather than and then ask a question on the uh, understanding or lack of understanding around uh, regulations and messaging from the political leadership around uh, the the pandemic and the virus and so on and i mean i'm i'm not surprised uh, young people are confused i was on the health committee uh, and i was confused about some of them uh, and uh, I see the chair who was who accompanied me on the health committee nodding his head as well. But I mean, and I'll give you I'll give you one example. And one of the problems is, is because if we're dealing with a public health emergency, all the decisions made should be made on the basis of public health 
and that doesn't always happen. Uh, and I'll give you one example. In, in, in early December, Matt Hancock, the English uh, health minister, said publicly that the virus was out of control in the south of England and that the new variant, which was much more transmissible, had become dominant. But still in all, you could hop on a plane in Heathrow, get off at George Best uh, City Airport, jump into a taxi or a bus or a train or go into the centre of Belfast and do your shopping or do whatever you wanted. And yet the health minister, the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor told us that that did not pose a significant risk to public health here. Now, I'm still scratching my head about that one because now the UK variant or the Kent variant, as it's sometimes getting, is getting called, is dominant here. The rise in infections was exponential. The number of deaths uh, rose massively as well uh, since, you know, Matt Hancock said that. So, you know, uh, the young people aren't the only one who are, who are confused about what's going on. Even some of us right in the midst of all of it are confused. So anyway, thanks for that. And thanks again for coming in. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, Natalie, were you still wanting in there? Or did your point pass? Um, hi, um, yes, thank you, Chris. Hi, I'm Natalie. I've uh, had the pleasure of working alongside the young people that you've heard from today um, from last March. So, yeah, I was just um, around mental health and children, young people's mental health, and, you know, I was thinking around things and things were pre-COVID. It's estimated that 45,000 children and young people in Northern Ireland have um, a mental health problem, but a lot of research and findings were done um, pre-COVID. So it's in terms of like, what does the impact of COVID has now? So like, I would be fully supported, supportive of government departments need to work together, but we need to talk to people on the ground who are working and supporting with young people. I feel as a worker, um, supporting young people through mental health problems, think we were already stretched before COVID and often statutory provision isn't there, not due to um, the fault of any doctors or nurses, but because services are underfunded, waiting times are through the roof. Um, and just a wee point around earlier as well, around young people having a right to have a voice um, and um, some of the points that were raised earlier, I think it's important to note as well that adults in society can vote and that's how their voice is exercised where um, young people don't have, um, or aren't 17 year olds and under aren't able to vote. So I think that's important to note too. So why are young people's voices being heard? Thank okay. you. Thanks for that, yeah, and definitely echoing what uh, Pat said earlier as well. I knew this morning somebody had asked me a question and I was straight on to the NI Direct website and pawing through to try and find the answer. Um, you would think that we should know what the answers are, but it's so complex and there's so many changes that you really, you, you just, you aren't assured of what the answers are. Um, so it's, it's no surprise that it's completely confusing. Um, I'm going to ask next for Trevor to be brought up into the um, spotlight and we'll get a question from himself then, please. So over to you, Trevor. Okay, Chair, thank you very much. And <clears throat> thank you to all the, the panelists. Uh, I must say, we hear plenty of presentations up here. I've never heard one with so much content and so many questions. And really, I think we're going to have to take some of this away and come back on it because there, there are a lot there. So I don't want to remember anything that anybody else has said. But I was struck by the 55% the who said the regulations were unclear. And that, that probably should be 100%. The, um, and that links to the 74%, I think it was, who have no confidence in government or precious little confidence in government. Uh, and also the one I wanted to ask you about was the impact of decisions. What do you think you mean is that, that decisions are taken by government, perhaps dare I say, by older people, without taking into account the effect on young people. Now, can, can you give us, you probably already have, but is there any really concrete examples that come to mind where government has taken decisions which are meant to benefit the whole population, but which perhaps do so at the expense of young people? Is that a fair question? Is there any of you who want to answer? Oh, 
OT, would you like okay. me to make a stab at, and then you can, you can come in behind me, would that be okay, yeah? Yeah, no, yeah, 100% that's fine. Yeah, thanks for that, Trevor. Here, listen, just on behalf of, on behalf of uh, myself and the group, just thanks for your positive feedback there. It's, it's um, as I said at the start, the young people never feel the, feel the impress, and uh, when I'm sitting back listening, I'm, I'm the same as yourself. Very, very engaging presentation. I think one of the key things, Trevor, about about the decision making process, and this is, I suppose, my analysis of part of what we're hearing. It's not so much about. I don't think about decisions being made to the detriment of young people. I think it's more about decisions that affect their lives. So one one example that I can give you there is about education. So young people are talking to us consistently. Um, and if I think about education, the number of times it's been in the news. So I'm thinking back to last term, school closing early, and then I'm thinking about school restart. Then... In fact, before that, there was the exam results. Wasn't that the algorithms? All those things were in the news. Mm -hmm. Then when we're getting young people back to school was in the news. Then, and then this cycle goes on. The, the transfer test was a big issue. And I guess what young people are saying is, why aren't you talking to us? Why aren't you talking to us about these things? Um, there was a campaign at the end of the last term by a group of young people uh, about putting the trust in teachers. So there was a campaign around, don't use an algorithm. Trust our teachers. Our teachers know us. Um, so young people are saying over and over again, listen, we, we have we have solutions here. We want to be part of this decision-making process. Um, so let us in. So, And I think that then relates to the faith, the, the faith question, you know. And, and overwhelmingly, people, young people have been saying to us, let us, let us be part of this. Uh, let us be part of this decision-making process. Um, and then just briefly on the, uh, the points about confusion, I think everyone's highlighted in here. That it is very confusing. Yeah, it's it's difficult to understand what the regulations are and aren't, and they do change quite a bit. Interestingly, I found that a lot of young people were educating me personally about uh, about you know what the regulations were, what you could and couldn't do. Um, uh, so there is there is a wee bit of sometimes young people are really bang on. You know they understand uh, what the regulations are, and other times. Other times, like society, uh, it is quite confusing. I don't know if that's entirely answered your question, Trevor. Is is there anyone I can see our, our chat with WeChat group here is lighting up, um, and Lauren and Natalie uh, and Jack have, have commented. Would any of you like to come in on the back of what I have said? I'll jump in if that's okay. Yep. Um, so what I'm thinking about is, yes, young people, they are they are in the decisions, you know that's the the, th the thinking behind it but it's about the um, ordinary moments of life that are being missed out and I think that's being overlooked and yes a, a pandemic's the absolute like focus here but and it should be and it should be the priority but young people are missing out on their moments that we we take for granted like I'm only 23 I graduated last summer and I missed out on my graduation. You know, there's simple moments like that that you look forward to for your lifetime and that's moments you won't get back and like yeah I, I just empathize with people that are going through similar experiences that I have and I, like I, I agree with Chris young people are leading the way forward um the secondary school union of Northern Ireland were the ones that run that a campaign and it was amazing young people are mobilizing more than ever this has geared their voices to really shout from the rooftops and I couldn't be prouder of the young people in Northern Ireland um so yeah they've just been a credit to themselves throughout this whole process okay is there anybody else there? Because there's just one more point to make, Chair, if you don't mind. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I was just gonna, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I was just going to, I was just going to jump in briefly with the algorithm. Yeah, right. So, because I think that's an example of the, of the effect on young people. So, I think, like, we had discussions in your forum about that before, and, and we knew that that algorithm would, uh, in a way, discriminate against people because you'd be using data based off previous assignments in schools and that it, and just in essence of a way you, you do that is that it means that people from low incomes people in, in more deprived areas would have their a level and gcse's pulled down and and um that was something that we had talked about before and it was it was always going to have an element of hurting the most vulnerable students um was there maybe a, a meaningful consultation on that no you know, there, there just wasn't, you know, and I think if you had told students, okay, your grades will be pulled down based off your school data, then they would have said, isn't that discrimination? 
aren't you hurting the most vulnerable? Mm-hmm. And but that 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 consultation wasn't done, and we know that under UNCRC, um, you know, uh, Article Twelve, you know, young people have the right to express their views in all matters that affect them, and for those views to be given weight, and that's a perfect example of their views not really having any meaningful consultation, and their views not being given weight until there was a wider media backlash. And that's the problem. We could have solved that before, but I'm going to stop talking. I just wanted to mention that because I think that's a great example. Okay, just just on the education thing, um, I have three grandchildren. I've got a 16 year old, a 14 year old, and a 12 year old. Uh, and I, I have heard a lot of this from them. You know, they, they, they're they suffering in unseen ways through all this. Uh, a 16 year old is preparing for his GCSE assessments and doing us not with the technology, frankly. The, the 14 year old, same age as you, Jack, I think. Uh, is trying to homeschool, and he's a, he's a very diligent wee lad and doing his best, but he can't help it if the internet keeps breaking down on him when he's three quarters of the way through an assignment. It just happens. And the 12 year old wee girl has only seen her new schoolmates um, three or four weeks so far. This, this, yeah. first part, you know, that's that's pretty, pretty awful. Plus, there's no, there's no sport for them, there's no interaction, no social interaction. I'm with you all the way on this. I mean, it really is a dreadful state of affairs, but I'm not quite sure. We have to we have to plan our way through the pandemic, and when I hear Chris talking about repeat year, perhaps there may be something in that. Um, I just wanted to ask Jack finally, because there's no real question there, but Jack, I can see you there. I'm just curious, is that a Manchester United or a Liverpool thing on the wall behind you? Oh. <laughs> Liverpool. Liverpool. <laughs> Well, I better not mention my, my Everton credentials. <laughs> okay, look, thank you, Trevor. Um, look, I'm going to bring Christopher Stalford uh, in next, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to kind of semi-crack the whip of uh, Chairman's role here because we still have another three speakers and we're nearly an hour and a half in. Um, so what I maybe suggest is if members can condense everything down into one question or one statement at the start, and then maybe if just one or two could give a response back to it, and then we'll get through the next three speakers, hopefully in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So, Christopher, we'll pass over to yourself. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank, uh, thank you, everyone, for um, the presentation um, that you gave. I am very familiar with the work of the Youth Forum. I was actually involved in some of the activities of the Youth Forum through the Boys' Brigade um, when, I was, uh, when I was coming up. And in terms of young people and politics and getting involved, I joined a political party when I was 14. Um, I was the youngest person elected to Belfast Council in 2005. I know I don't have the luck of a, of a hard paper. I've had a hard paper round, but I was, I was 21 when I was elected to the council for the, for the first time. So I absolutely uh, applause and support and encourage young people to get involved um, in politics and political activity and, and public discourse. Um, I have four children and um, younger than Trevor's, my, my eldest daughter's in P6. P6 obviously is a very important year and she's lost almost the entirety of it. Mm. Uh, the home learning and the homeschooling is very difficult when not only have a daughter P6, I have a son of P5, another son in P3 and a toddler running around the, my ankles. So I know what stress is when you're trying to do three sets of homework with uh, a toddler running about your ankles. So, you know, Stalford Primary School can be a bit chaotic at times. So I think that adults are certainly experiencing the stress of, of this situation. I also represent the area that includes Queen's University and I have been contacted by lots of people. And I, I think it's frankly unscrupulous behavior that if students aren't able to get a, to get their year at university, for landlords to be holding them to contracts on the properties, I just think is is really unfair and and they should they may have the law on their side, as in a contract has been signed, but the moral and the decent thing to do would be to cut people a break. I want to ask about just the student experience and the loss of the student experience. In the presentation you mentioned was made about the option of repeating a year, whether that's a primary school at any stage, all the way through to university. 
I I have to say I have some sympathy with with this. And then, what are the implications of if you institute that approach in terms of university? Do you know what I mean? So the university admissions and it's almost like a domino effect. But I I have I have some sympathy with this um, because, as I say, my own personal experience, I would. I think it would be beneficial for my child to be repeating P6 because she's lost so much of it. But I would just be interested in your your assessment of what the knock-on effect of that would be for university admissions and also actually for, I know nursery education is not uh, a legal requirement, but even for kids that would be coming through in the nursery this year. So if, maybe if you talk to that a wee bit, that would be, I'd be interested in your ideas. And thank you for, for everything that you said. Thank you. Um, I, you froze a little bit for me, cause I, but I'm going to just jump in because I'm a university student here because Adam had to leave, unfortunately. Um, he, he has to go uh, do some work. But um, in, in terms of its effect on university admissions, I know actually that would be one. And there are uh, actual real capacity problems in universities, and maybe that would be a challenge. But actually, you can actually look at it in terms of the maximum aggregate student number cap. Uh, which is an operation of a north and what that means is that actually students um the student numbers are limited by the executive so uh the capacity doesn't necessarily uh the real capacity in terms of the university doesn't necessarily meet that aggregate student number cap so we know that universities like Ulster have been fined money because they take they took on too many students which I, I see it as a little absurd. I understand why, because the executive has to put money towards students. But if you remove that number, and that would at least help a little bit that the universities would be able to take as much as many students to actually meet the capacity they can facilitate and not have to deal with an arbitrary number. Because I always I always find that very sad that we're that number and we don't have time to talk about it a lot, but I would encourage you to look into it, is that that number can mean that we lose students here. Students who could get capacity at Queen's or Ulster have to go to England. And we suffer brain drain because talented young people are going to England and they're staying in England because they have to, because there's an arbitrary number that the executive has, you know. And, and, and so removing that number would actually be one way to deal with um, capacity in terms of universities. And and I, I don't necessarily know how, how many people would, would want to stay back a year. But I know if I look into my experiences as a young person, as a young person with a disability who had a classroom assistant uh, growing up, I would not have been able to function properly in that environment. And I look back and I think, would I be in university now, you know, studying politics, philosophy and economics if I lost that year and lost that classroom assistant support from that school that, you know, helped me um, develop in a healthy way? I don't think I would. So in my case, I think I would really have to stay back a year. And it's about the individual choice. We shouldn't, you know, hurt young people's long-term prospects because it would face a lot of administrative challenges. And it would, and, I, I, and you're right in that end. But some young people's long-term prospects would suffer greatly. And I, I don't really think that's fair. I just know for me, without the support I had to get me through school, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. And I don't think I could have uh, handled it very well. Can I, I don't really have time, but can I jump in on, jump to Chris, was it, who wanted to jump in on, on the, on the, on the school experience, not university? Is that right? Yeah. Yes, thanks, OT. And just, um, just really quickly, because I know we are pushed for time. I think for me, uh, Christopher, it's about opening up that conversation and really looking at it. I think we need to look at it because we have done some very initial work. And I know Natalie will come in behind me to talk about this a little bit more, but in some of the groups that we're operating in, we have posed this question, and there is mixed view, there are mixed views. So for some people nearing the end of their student experience in university, for example, they want to get over that line, they want to finish, they want to get out and work. Um, on the other end of that spectrum, you have children who mightn't have the literacy and numeracy um, requirements that they, they need to, to go into post-primary education. Or um, I think the challenges with uh, the, the if the challenges with online learning, it, the assumption is that you can read very, very basically. You know, the assumption is that you can read what's being put in that screen. And that's not, OT is very articulately spoken about his journey. So I think for me, it's about opening up that conversation and having an inquiry into that. Because I know it's not, not every young person will agree. There are mixed views. And I'm talking, I suppose as a parent, I'm talking, I'm seeing my children missing out as a, 
as a person working with young people, I'm hearing all these different um, these different views. So I, I think we need to open up that conversation really quickly and look at it. Natalie, did you still want to come in on the back of that? No, no, you okay? Yeah, okay. So yeah, it's, I think it's just about choice and an inquiry. Open up an inquiry into that as expediently as we can. You know. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, Christopher, for that question. Christopher elected at age twenty-one to the council is a great role model there for young people. Yeah. All the, the, those forty years have flown past, Christopher, haven't they? Very popular belief. He wasn't elected in eighteen forty-six. <laughs> we'll say nothing. All right, listen. Thank you, Christopher. We'll pass next then to Martina Anderson, please. If we could get Martina up into the spotlight, please, and then we'll take the question from herself. Uh, thank you, Ian. It's it's hard to distill after all of those different presentations into one question. So the chair will try and cut me off, I'm sure, but it's impossible with you to do justice by just asking a question. I want to say I was really taken by Jack uh, in the first instance as, as the first person on um, after Chris there because all that you said in relation to what your experience and uh, with regards to the restrictions in education and I suppose it struck me that it was crucially important uh, to be talking about the um, the different committees and therefore having the like of um, some of the members here like Pat, Pat Sheehan who's on the education committee that sort of gives you an understanding that you're not just talking to MLAs who's on this one committee because you know we're on different committees so even when I was listening to some of the things you were saying I was also having my infrastructure head on me because I'm very much of the few nothing about you's without you so I am a firm believer in participatory democracy uh, I don't believe that any um, elected representative should be in any institution that doesn't have a participatory access uh, you know that part of it so one of the things that um that when chris was saying there's been a 13 year campaign i remember it well um almost uh, throughout that the history of that ca campaign to get uh in the assembly a youth forum uh, i have spoken and prior to his coming on here today i had spoken to the speaker and just to get an update as to where things are at because i was under the impression and i think you're all across this now that the fact that this speaker is actually taking the Youth Assembly really, really serious, and there has been senior management team assigned to it. There's been a co-design group set up. There's been a advisory group. I know Chris is on the advisory group, and they think that there've been 90 young people in the Assembly in a few short months. So I'm personally excited about that. I think we all are to be able to hear more of your voices, just like we've had a, the pleasure and opportunity, and that's not me patronizing you. Uh, I hope some of you know me well enough. I don't do that. But, you know, to hear what you have had to say today, and it's just to pick up then, I think it was Adam, when, when you talked about the press conference, I think therein lies your platform, your opportunity, because as the Youth Forum Assembly is going to be set up, that should be part of maybe the conversations that you're having with the Speaker around how then you engage with people outside of the Assembly to let them know the work that you're doing within it. So just to pick up then on a couple of points, uh, Blair, that you'd, you'd mentioned a number of things, but I'm uh, one of my responsibilities for Sinn Féin is anti-poverty spokesperson. So I was very uh, acutely aware of everything you were saying around food poverty. And um, I think that we need to be elevating that issue of you know, food poverty and food insecurity. Um, I think it's absolutely appalling. It's unacceptable in, a, in the Western world that we're hearing things like what you have outlined today, what Spotlight revealed last night. And I think there's models there for us to look at. Scotland is doing a right to food bill. It's out for consultation at the moment. Uh, and that's something that uh, that I think as an assembly, uh, we should be looking at. Adam, when you were talking about, and you were saying about the job you were doing, uh, there's a, um, a private member's bill from one of the MLAs in relation to trying to end zero hour contracts. Um, because I think the insecurity of jobs for people like yourselves and others, that is, that's also something. And then there is, you know, you'd mentioned that those of us when we were 18, Fado Fado, long ago, maybe, for some of us, you know, we had the right to vote. I mean, I think at 16, if you can join an army, 
uh, you should have the right to vote. If you're not in a bank account, you should have the right to vote. So I was very much uh, beyond all the few as Sinn Féin has been of that right to vote. What you said in relation to mental health, I think it's important for you to all know, you know, you're not just talking to a group of public reps that don't understand this. We have friends, family members who are struggling just as maybe some of the people that you have talked about too. We understand the depth of this. We understand the impact that it's having on people's lives. We live it. It's our lived experience. Uh, just like sitting here today doing this over Zoom with you, we'd all much better be in a room with you. The, I think the interaction is, is, is much greater in that, in that way. But this is, look, it has enabled us to do it. So thankfully for Zoom and Starleaf and all the other platforms that are there. So the thing that you mentioned, it's all also struck me, and I'll end with this because it's more comments, but maybe to hear your views on it. I have done some work looking at Derry, say the Foyle constituency, and looking at the kind of allocations that have come in here uh, over a number of years. And the Western Trust, obviously, now that goes beyond Derry. It's you know right into parts of Mid Ulster and Tyrone and, uh, and and parts of East Derry as well. So, but even just taking that, you think a big geographical area, and it picks up on a point that Pat had said about physical health and the importance of mental health. When I looked at the funding allocation to acute services, which require this, now, I do think there's there's an issue around how we spend our money in hospitals. That's for another discussion for another day and um, it's not not and that's not saying anything about the doctors and nurses you couldn't pay them enough um, but there's there's some things in terms of procurement the way things are spent but when I looked at the funding chair there was like now I'm going to give you the wrong fingers this is ballpoint but there were somewhere like 150 million spent on acute services maybe in 2007 and there may be close to 300 million being spent today and yet when I looked at mental health there was like 20 million somewhere around there being spent on mental health. And there's only 30 million being spent on it today. So I think that exposes the fact that there hasn't been due regard given to that issue of mental health. And of course, what you had said, how it's impacting on young people, it's impacting on every age group uh, across the society. And therefore, I think that what you're bringing to, to us today is definitely something that there needs to be a more cross-departmental working uh, on these issues. The problem that we are all engaged with and we are all conscious of is that these departments work very much in a, a silo mentality. And therefore, trying to encourage cross-departmental work is somewhat challenging for all of us. But you're pushing at an open door, but you do not want tea and sympathy. You want to come to a meeting today and just be heard. So it's probably up to us then to try to take on board everything that you've said. And for me, the hope that I have for yourselves is that we will see in a few short months the Youth Assembly uh, being established and not giving you a platform, a voice to express all that you did with us today beyond just the room of a committee. Shinshin. Okay. Does anybody want to respond to those remarks? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pass on the group now. Oh, no, she's already something anyway. You may need to. Go ahead, Blaine. Um, thank you very much, Martina. Um, Poverty is a big thing um, that I would be very passionate about. Um, I've done a lot of research and in and around and young people's um, lives are nearly mapped out for them by the moment they come home from hospital. So depending where you come home to and depending what area you are um, coming home to will possibly depend how your future is laid out. Um, we would welcome more cross-departmental um, approaches um, especially a lot of my work is within the house and executive and working alongside young people and I suppose the importance of everybody working on the same level like there's so much good work been done out there recently like so much um, and I suppose it's about bringing all that work together and, and everybody working off the same um, hymn sheet so to speak and um, the impact that of universal credit the impact of everything that it has on young people like it goes right the way through like Whenever uh, you're suffering from poverty and you're suffering from mental health, that has an impact on your home life, your education, your well-being. It's a knock-on effect. And I think if we can 
try and tackle um, small things that could lead to beautiful destinations. It's something I always say with a new uniform, like small steps always lead to beautiful destinations. And there is all this good work going on. So I suppose it's about bringing all this good work together and moving forward with the cross-departmental approach. So that's just really, I wanted to come in. Um, if anybody else has got anything to add to that. Okay, thank you for that there. And thank you, Martina, for, for that uh, question and those comments. And I'll pass on next then to Emma Sheeran. Uh, and Emma, if you want to get you up into the spotlight and get a question from yourself, um, the panel will be pleased to know we're getting towards the end because you have been well grilled with these questions that are coming through today. So Emma, we'll pass over to yourself. Thanks, Chair. I'm not sure if you guys can hear me yet. We can. Brilliant. Look, I don't want to, to rehash anything at this stage you have been put through your paces. Um, I want to start off just by reiterating, I mean, that presentation was brilliant and, and great to get um, such a range of of, of views from you all and I know Blair had, had come in again there but she had started said it that they had said that she was nervous and, and had absolutely no need to be um because because hearing that voice very strongly and, and the issues that are affecting you I, I think it is is key and it's very useful for us and, and that's already been said by by all the the reps that have spoken to you. I suppose I had some questions. I know talking about the issues that Martina had touched on there around the, the poverty and we can see that COVID has had a disproportionate impact on women and children as a result and I often think young people are probably you know forgotten about and, and children within a, a household and, and young people can can bear the brunt of that but it's it's almost hidden um, from, from the general population we think of the adults and, and the impact that it's having on them and the, the experiences that you have relayed there have, have been very useful. I can see that in terms of the, the issues that are affecting the groups in your presentation, boredom comes up um, amongst all of the age ranges, as does mental health wellbeing. I, I had a question around, and I haven't seen you, you mentioning it um, either in your verbal presentation or in the, the PowerPoint that you've, you've presented, uh, and I'm not sure if I have missed it, and, and I'm, I, I just wondered around the impact of social media and if that was was proven to be a useful tool for young people during this time or if it was contributing um, to, to the, the anxiety that people are feeling and, and, and what the, the outcome of that is. I also then had a question around your own group and the rural engagement. I'm, I'm a South Derry rep and I always will, will speak to the rural experience and I just wondered, you know, because I know myself, I think I'm the youngest member on the committee here. I don't feel it. But 10 years ago, I was in first year at university and I remember the, the anxiety that I experienced at that time, the stress around exams, all the different worries that I had. And at that stage, you know, there was no Instagram. There, were, there was social media, but it was playing a much, much, much smaller role than it is currently. And obviously COVID-19 wasn't something that I had to deal with. So trying to consider the impact of all of that and then adding this global pandemic. And I know that I'm getting very strongly here that the, the schooling and the uncertainty around um, school and university and the missing out on the social aspect of that is, is playing a big uh, role in people's mental health. And I suppose we can all acknowledge and accept that because of the health situation, the closure of, of physical learning spaces is necessary, but I would think and, and potentially identify that it's the lack of a plan, it's the lack of certainty. And even, you know, given that we're all, it's a, it's a moving situation, nobody could expect the education minister to know a year ago where we were going to be now. But if we had had maybe, and if going forward we have, if, you know, the R number is in such a place at such a time, we will do this that even there were options clearly laid out so that people knew you know what was likely to happen based on on where the, the health um, situation was so just wondered if, if there were any comments or, or feedback coming in and, and, and thank you again this has been a really useful uh, presentation for, from my end and I've, I've really enjoyed it thank you yeah i'm happy to jump on um there emma thank you for your question um I think that's a totally important um issue around social media and how that impacts. Um, for us as an organisation, um, we turn to social media as a key engagement tool in terms of interacting with young people. And I think we all have, if we're really honest, in terms of the um pandemic and how we interact with even our loved ones. Um, 
I know on a Saturday night we do a Zoom quiz with my nanny and granddad just to say hello and get the crack going. So, you know, it is a new normal as such, um, but there's definitely pros and cons. So we tried to turn our social media platforms into a, a resource of positivity nearly. So we have a resource called Life Maps, and that's about positive psychology and how we spin that and adapt that to online. It is usually a physical course, but we we turned that around. Um, but there's also the there's pros and cons, definitely. So young people are turning to gaming to fill their time, you know, going on games consoles and stuff. And I know that's how I'm engaging with my friends as well, even. And it's great. There's a, It's an alternative way of socialising, but it's staring at a screen for hours. I know there's young people sitting all day on school um, on a laptop and then they're sitting in front of the TV or the gaming screen. So there's definitely pros and cons. Um, another thing we've spoke um, in depth about is young people getting information on social media. In our first survey, we looked at where young people were getting information and social media was one of the top kind of places they were getting it. They were listening to the press conferences, but sometimes that's not totally engaging for a young person. Um, and it, it's good and bad. Um, we have talked around fake news and what does that mean in our society today and what's true and what's false. And it's it's hard to interpret. I think um, we've, we've talked today about um, understanding the regulations, the rules, restrictions, but it's all like you don't know what to believe. There's not a blue tick that says verified the way Twitter does, you know. Um, so it is an interesting um thing. Also, in relation to that, is the broad um the digital divide and the access to these things. So there, there's so much to talk about in relation to social media, and I think um as a young person, it's maybe looking at where perspective comes into this. So. A young person looks at it and be like, oh, it's great. I'm talking to my friends all day, every day. It's amazing. I'm liking, everyone's liking my pictures. But at the same time, it's maybe not as positive the way parents are looking at it um, to be. But I'll open the floor if anyone else wants to jump in there. Um, I'll just jump in very briefly with the rural issue. So I'm a Stoban man, not exactly rural, but more rural than some of my Belfast friends here. <laughs> um, but I, I think one thing is clear, and that's the quality of internet. So low bandwidth, it makes it hard for students, uh, people working from home, to actually engage properly. I know, um, you know, when I had work, when I had a, a, a team project with someone who was in a rural area, um, they just couldn't engage properly because the internet kept going up and on. I can't have a conversation because of the lag, it doesn't work. And so people in rural areas are more affected by that. And again, transport links mean that actually you're even more isolated from people. And if you're, if you're suffering from poverty and you're in a rural area, and there's bad transport links. It just means there's even more barriers to have access to mental health services. They get to a food bank. So yeah, rural rural issues. We do, we don't have a data. We don't have a data breakdown on in terms of um, the effect of on people from rural areas. We probably could do that because we do have geographical information in the survey. We just haven't done it. But those issues regarding internet, transport, and access to services come up again and again. Um, and, 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 you know, I know uh, uh, Jack was saying that actually, uh, if you're, uh, if you're a rural, from a rural area, that makes it even more likely you might have to repeat the year because you actually don't have access to high quality education. If I have good internet, at least I can somewhat engage effectively. If I don't, and that really hurts a lot in terms of engagement. So yeah, that's what I just wanted to jump in briefly on, on rural issues. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I just make one wee final point on this? I think, like I've said to many of the committee members today, I think there's a lot of, we need more information on a lot of these areas. I think we need to inquire further into the longer term impact of, of COVID-19. And I definitely think social media and gaming is a big, a big part of it. I had a conversation internally today with the Deputy Director of the Youth Forum about our concern about the hours that our staff are spending in front of the screen and how that can have an impact on you as an individual. So I'm sure it's the same for lots of people in this room and how unhealthy that is. I also read an article recently about the importance of routine uh, because we know that young people sometimes uh, sleep all day and game all night, uh, don't leave their room. Um, and yes, the, the feedback is I'm, I'm engaging with my friends, I'm socialising, it's an outlet. And there have been articles to say that gaming is an outlet for um, for positive mental health and wellbeing. Um, but I think it's about, it's about getting positive messages out there. It's about encouraging people to have routine to take breaks from screens. You know, I remember 
I remember we always used to get told that we needed 20 minutes away from, or every so often you needed, was it every 20 minutes you needed to look away from a screen when we first started working uh, on computers? Um, and I think sitting in front of a screen for your working day or maybe longer, you know, so you're, if you're socializing, if you're studying, if you're doing your sport on screen, that's an awful long time. So I would be worried about the longer term effects of this. And I think we do need to look into that. And as OT said, I mean, he alluded to rural rural young people. I think if, if you consider those most in need, those most disadvantaged, and the impact the digital divide has, we have heard stories about young people who have been put in temporary accommodation in ho hotels and B&Bs where the TV is taken off the wall. Um, so can you imagine sitting in a hotel room on your own uh, with no television, maybe no internet, no phone? Um, so there, I think I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is that we have heard about pros and cons, um, but I think it's about getting positive messages out about your own well-being and um, maybe thinking about the longer term impact. Okay, Emma, thank, thank you for that question and, and thank you guys for the response. Um, Okay, look, I think we've had questions from all the representatives that are looking to ask the questions. And, um, you know, again, if I can just reiterate the point that I said at the start, which was that, you know, it's clear, articulate and informed voices. And we really have had an insight into the uh, COVID pandemic as faced by young people. Um, and I hope that certainly whilst our committee isn't necessarily charged with taking the decisions that impact um, everyday lives for young people. We certainly have that scrutiny role and that influencing role to those that actually do take those decisions. And, and a number of the issues that you have raised uh, and the challenges that you have set for us today are relevant for other committees as well, uh, as well as our own committee. And we will certainly pass on that information and put forward those requests that they engage with yourselves Certainly one of the things that I wanted to achieve out of today was, I suppose, to, to highlight and show how powerful your voice is, because if other representatives see how powerful your voice is and see the engagement and see the benefit of it, then hopefully uh, they will mimic that and ask you to come and interact with them and their committees. So I want to take the opportunity um, to thank uh OT, Adam, Jack, Blair, and then with Lauren, Natalie, and Chris, and say thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for being that voice for your peers. Please continue to be that voice. It's needed. It's relevant. It's not being heard by those in power, but I know that whenever you collectively shout, it will be. And I think if we can do that in partnership, we as a committee will certainly do all that we can to help you. And we will come back to you on the issues that you've raised for, for us today. And I just take the chance to say again, thank you very much. And to wish you all the best with your group work and your work as you go forward. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Okay. And comms team will reallocate people around there. This is the sort of the digital way of saying goodbye is the uh, actual comms team moving you out of the spotlight. So uh, that moves there on. And what we'll do is we'll just repopulate the spotlight with the members again um, and maybe if I could speak to or ask for advice you're up on the screen in front of me anyway there uh, Michael just what maybe in terms of going forward there were quite a number of um, specific requests and issues there might it be a suggestion if we get a short paper put together which actually captures all of those uh, if that was maybe circulated round members and then members could add to that and then maybe at next week's meeting at the beginning we could assess that and take a decision as to what we're actually uh, going to do because there was there were quite a number of points that were actually raised and actions that they wanted to see us to do and i know it might add a few days to it but it means that we'll actually capture everything that was there would that be agreeable with members and if um if michael puts together a paper and it's in our pack for next week and people get a chance to add to that uh, or, or, or to redirect some of the information that's on it, and those actions could all be approved under um, the agenda for next week. Bertina, you're looking in there. Yeah, I agree with what you proposed. I would also suggest that either run in parallel with that, or you may want to return to it next week, but we should get some information from the speaker around the Youth Assembly 
to get us an update as to where that's at, because I think all this information that you have um, and they have imparted to us today, that that's where we will find expression. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a really exciting opportunity, actually, that Youth Assembly, and it's really good to see it moving on. So, Michael, would you be okay to do that as well for us, please, to write to the speaker and get an update about the, the Youth Assembly? Yes. Okay. Um, probably from our timelines, that, that well ran over uh, what we had uh, allocated for, but I think uh, if members would agree, it was important that we heard everything that needed to be said there. So thank you to all the members and also for the little jigging around of the order of speakers to accommodate everybody getting in. Um, members, so we move on to item six, which is the forward work programme. It's on page 30 of the meeting pack. And the only element that I need to remind members of is that we did agree to schedule an effective questioning training session um, that we have been offered the date of the 5th of May. It's a 90 minute session. I, I did want to just take a temperature check as to whether members would like that. So um, would members like that to be scheduled? <laughs> Yes. Tell us more information. Yeah. So go again, Martina. Could you give us some more information about it? Well, certainly, because I like that we're questioning the effective questioning training. Is <laughs> I like where this is going. Um, Michael, do you want do you want to give us an update? Remind us what what the effective questioning sessions about. I have to say, Chair, it was, it was before my time. Um, I think it was it was uh, uh, requested back in in October time, uh, but um, and, and I, I believe some some other committees have availed of it and, and found it quite useful. Uh, but but I, I will get back and I will circulate to members uh, more detailed information as to what's in the course. Uh, what, 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 what I've seen ha uh, hasn't been particularly comprehensive so far. Uh, but, but I'll get a more detailed uh, version of, of, of what's expected. Okay, and we can we have plenty of time between now and the 5th of May to, to decide on that. So we'll get some more information for next week. So, members, are you content to note the forward work programme? Okay, perfect. Uh, item seven is uh, correspondence, and there are eight items in the pack. Um, one item was just item 7.7 .7 on page 52 is correspondence from a full-time student outlining the difficulties faced when studying remotely during the COVID pandemic and uh, very relevant now after what we've just listened to. But it's just to get the formally that that maybe should be uh, forwarded to the economy committee as that's where it actually uh, falls under in terms of responsibility. So can I just get agreement that we'll pass that on to the economy committee? Okay, thank you. Um, then, members, on the chairman's liaison group, um, there was a discussion about the responsibility for um, scrutinising the programme for government. Uh, and it is there was a suggestion under NDNA that a separate committee would be established for that and at the chairman's liaison group that would decide whether or not that committee needs to be formed. There was a discussion which basically reflected that the executive office committee uh, is charged already with the scrutiny of the programme for government and whether or not that we should continue with that or whether a separate committee should be established. Um, the, f the first I really heard of it was at the meeting and I said that effectively I was quite relaxed as to whether or not we took the scrutiny of the overall management of the programme for government a little bit like Brexit but where there's a specific reference to a particular committee that that particular committee would undertake the scrutiny. So if there was a matter pertaining to education, it would go to education, agriculture, go to agriculture, but the overall implementation is what we uh, could scrutinize. Or would members prefer for us to say, no, let's send it back to the chairman's liaison group and ask for a specific subcommittee to be set up. So I'm fairly relaxed either way and I'm happy to take members' opinions on that. Anybody got a, a, a view? Anybody? Oh. Okay. Pat, give us a sigh there, which brought him up into the spotlight. So you're not, <laughs> I think that's putting you on the, <laughs> on the spot to give us an answer or certainly prevent any future sighs. 
Uh, no, I, I, I have no difficulty with uh, with what you're saying there, uh, Chair. Okay. Uh, even yeah. though what I was saying was an option, one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Look, we, maybe I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll leave it this week as a thought. Uh, we'll revisit it next week because the Chairman's Liaison Group isn't for another few weeks. It's once a month and it was... I think last week, the week before. So maybe if members take a thought as to whether we should do the scrutiny of the program for government or whether that MDNA suggestion that there should be a separate set up. If, if members want to take a week to think about that and we'll discuss it next week and then we, we'll know where we are with it. Martina, you're looking in there? No, I think probably what Pat was saying, we're just the direction of travel I thought you were going on was that we would do it because this is yeah. the home of MDNA in terms yeah. of this, the committee. So even though obviously it's going to involve work, but it'll allow us to keep our heads around it and whatever about another, you know, a subcommittee of whatever to do it, you're going to find it might be a number of MLEs and it may be some of us on this committee. So I thought what you were saying that we should do it. Okay. And, and I thought that's what Pat was concurring with uh, in the first instance. I think it's this is its home that we have a remit and uh, it would be, I think it would be worthwhile for us uh, just to be tracking it. Okay. Trevor, would you be happy enough? You're the only other member beside myself and the guys. Is you, Would you be happy enough with that as a as a perspective? Well, yes, I would tend to agree with Martina. It, that belongs to us. don't see the need for a separate committee. More committees is okay. not a great thing. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's great. That's direction for me. I'll bring that back to them. Um, okay, so our members content to note the rest of the correspondence. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, item eight is any other business, and just one of the items that I wanted to raise under any other business, as mentioned earlier, was there were a number of items that were uh, of actions that were from last week's meeting, uh, the joint meeting, uh, which we didn't get a chance to formalise after that meeting to, the, as actions. So, uh, the number of suggestions were made at the meeting. Um, and as I say, they weren't formally put to the committee for agreement at that stage. The proposed, um, my, the, those proposed by members of the committee were ongoing cooperation between the two committees, a joint piece of work on citizenship and a joint letter to the European Commission on ongoing difficulties associated with Brexit. Um, I think the first two are broadly similar in the sense of it's a joint piece of work on citizenship and, and greater cooperation between the two committees, and then very specifically um, the issue of a joint letter on the European Commission. Those were proposed last week. So could I get those formally adopted, and then next then we can look at how we'll do those. So are members, members happy with those as a, a way forward? Okay, uh, and then what I would do is I would suggest that the two clerks maybe liaise with each other on the possibilities of uh, ongoing cooperation and working together and also maybe look at what was said at last week's meeting and maybe drafting some form uh, of letter that could be circulated to both committees for approval and then uh, could be sent from there. Would, would members be agreeable with that? Yeah. Okay, all righty then, that's fine. Um, right, okay. Um, Pat, you had an issue under uh, any other business that you wanted to raise? Yes, Chair, and I, I suppose it comes up uh, as a result of the paper that uh, Shauna is going to speak to, uh, outlining the, the structures that are in place for the Brexit protocol and so on. And one of the issues is around the joint consultative working group and essentially this this is the forum where the EU informs the UK uh, about EU legislation uh, that applies to the north here uh, and the, the the meetings can be confidential but the uh, co-chairs can decide to release agendas and summaries of minutes uh, if, if they wish and the British government also gave a commitment uh, to invite officials from the executive uh, office to form part of the the delegation to uh, the consultative working group meetings. Now, uh, the, the paper also tells us that there was a meeting on the 29th of January. Uh, and 
it's my understanding that no information has been passed on to the executive. Uh, I, I had some concern that information had been passed to the executive that then hadn't come to us. But my understanding now is that there was no information went to the executive about that meeting. And I think the, the I'm proposing that the committee should write the Gove about this uh, and, uh, and ask for information and regular briefings about those particular meetings. Okay, Pat, excellent. Uh, a mind reader, I think, is going to be the, the term because that was certainly one of the issues that we were going to raise, or certainly Shauna was going to be raising uh, on that briefing. And I think you're right that we, we give it this the public forum to be able to, to ask about those um, meetings and, and what's happening in them. So if members are agreeable, we'll, we'll write that letter and ask for uh, information about what was taking place at those meetings and, uh, you know, for greater connectivity because like everything in, in the world of democracy, it doesn't look good if things are sort of done uh, in secret, uh, those sorts of issues, especially whenever there's decisions that are being taken at those meetings. So are, are members agreeable with that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Martina? Uh, just uh, another maybe issue to add on to that we might want to consider, given that the information we've heard about the commissioner coming here tomorrow, the EU commissioner, to meet with some groups um, in civic society and, and it's just for this committee to get some information it's going to be too late by the time the next meeting comes as to you know who's meeting with is it going yeah. to be enough representation of uh, across the society because as far as i understand if he's engaging with the british government and in line with what pat has said about the way they have handled things and uh, they may not be directed towards a fair representation of uh, of all of the people here. So I don't know, Chair, if you can ask the information as to who he's meeting and get it out to the members. Okay, Michael, could you check that with the, the DALO then and see if we could get maybe some of that information if it's available? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the date, time and place then of the next meeting will be uh, next Wednesday uh, via Starleaf again. Uh, and if members are content, then we are now going to move into closed session. Uh, just to get a briefing on some items. Uh, can I ask the broadcasting sure that all the witnesses that have joined? Have Committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee room 30.